So after breaking down the movement of some of the best strikers in MMA and boxing, there have been a couple of recurring themes. And one of those themes is the stretch shorten cycle. But that stretch shorten cycle is very important to start from the hip extended of the stretch shorten cycle right there. He's taking advantage of that stretch shorten cycle. Because of this, I had already been planning this video for a while. And I also had some questions about it recently, so the timing was pretty appropriate. This is how the video will go. First, we'll get a better scientific understanding of the stretch shorten cycle through its neural and mechanical components. Then we'll look at some of the footage and explain how it helps fighters. And lastly, we'll talk about some of the ways that you can use the stretch shorten cycle to benefit your training. All right, so let's start with defining the stretch shorten cycle. As described in the literature, it's an eccentric phase or stretch followed by an isometric transitional period, the amortization phase, leading to an explosive concentric action. In order to better understand what this means, we first have to understand the differences between eccentric, isometric, and concentric. And for these definitions, we're gonna use the squat since it's really easy to visualize and it's the movement that's most used in the strength and conditioning literature. Okay, so we're going to use this view. This is Lu Xiaozun. He's a Olympian, a Chinese Olympian. He's one of my idols back whenever I was a competitive weightlifter. Uh, he holds several world records in the 77 kilo, or what used to be 77 kilo. The weight class has changed recently. But we're going to be looking and primarily focusing on the quads since, like I said before, in the strength and conditioning literature, this is a movement that they look at. So the quads are going to be performing on the descent and eccentric contraction. Okay, the eccentric means that you are, the muscle is elongating while it is producing force. So at the top of the squat, as he starts to lower down, the squats that attach a little bit lower than the knee, and then close to the hip, one of them actually attaches at the hip, are getting longer as they're controlling the weight. So that even though they're producing force, they are elongating. Now once he gets to the bottom of the squat here, that pause, then this is, this is the isometric phase. ISO meaning the same, metric meaning length. It's producing force, but maintaining its same length. So that isn't the isometric portion of whenever we start to reference the strength or short stretch shorting cycle or the stretch reflex. This is what we're talking about, also known as the amortization phase, the transition from the concentric to the eccentric. And there has to be an isometric in there somewhere in varying lengths and times. He pauses for a little bit at the bottom of this, pretty common in, in weightlifting. But as he starts to come up, this is the concentric phase. So talk about the attachments. Up here, lower than the thigh, one of them is a little bit higher than the hip. Upper part of the femur and then down past the knee. The muscle is shortening to raise him up with the weight. Okay, so one more time, think about the quads getting longer as they produce force and control the descent the isometric phase is, or and, and amortization phase are not exactly the same. But the isometric phase is one that can vary in length. We want it to be as short as possible. You'll see it later. It is, it is producing force, holding him in position while maintaining its length. And then the concentric phase is shorting, shortening the muscle belly as he raises up. So those are the eccentric, isometric, amortization phase and then concentric phase that we'll use regularly as we continue to talk about the stretch shorten reflex. Now that we know the types of muscle contractions, we need to understand two more concepts in order to understand how the best strikers in the world take advantage of this phenomenon. The first is neurological in nature and has something to do with intrafusal muscle fibers or muscle spindles. These muscle spindles detect when a quick stretch is put on the muscle. When this is detected, a signal is sent to the spinal cord and directly back to the muscle to elicit a contraction. So in order to conceptualize this fully, let's look at a couple of diagrams and then somebody jumping and taking advantage of this concept. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do here is watch this guy perform the counter movement jump full speed, uh, just so you can get a, an idea of what they mean when they're talking about a counter movement jump in these, in the literature, and then we will go from there. So, really quick descent, jump, and land. All right, so let's work our way back. So to start, we're going to start with the eccentric phase. We've already talked about this. Muscle is elongating while it's producing force, but this eccentric phase is happening a much quicker here. And this is important because as soon as it starts to switch to that amortization phase, boom, this is when the neuro or the neurophysiological portion of the stretch reflex is taking place and the mechanical, but we'll get there a little bit later. So we talked about intrafusal fibers or the muscle spindle. These structures are what are detecting the quick change in muscle length. So whenever he goes down, the muscle is getting longer and then it's rapidly getting shorter, right? it's rapidly going to get shorter right there. It is going to get rapidly shorter right after this phase, sorry. So 
This detects the change in length of the muscle. Then it sends a signal to the spinal cord. This right here is the spinal cord. So if you took the spine and a spinal cord and you cut it in half and then looked down the center of it, this is what you would see. So the muscle spindle detects a change in length, a quick change in length. It sends a signal, don't worry about afferents, motor neurons, antagonist muscle, don't worry about any of that. Just know that it sends a signal directly to the spinal cord and back to the muscle. It does not go up to be interpreted by the brain. This is what reflexes are. Think about whenever the doctor hits your knee with a hammer and your leg just kicks up, this is another reflex, okay? So, one more time. Very, very quick descent, pause. Interfusal muscle fibers detecting a change in length. It sends a signal to the spinal cord and back to the muscle to rapidly contract and jump. Good. Let's review that one more time. Quick eccentric contraction, amortization phase, all this is happening. The interfusal muscle fibers of the muscle spindle detects a rapid change in muscle length. It sends a signal to the spinal cord initiating the stretch reflex, coming back to the same muscle, in this case will be the quadriceps, to forcefully contract concentrically and get more force production as a result of that stretch reflex. And that is the neurophysiological portion of the stretch shortened cycle. Now let's take a look at the mechanical properties. This ends up being a much more simple explanation than the neural component. This refers to the tension that's put on non-contractile tissue whenever we do explosive movements. So when tension is applied to these tissues, it subsequently recoils and provides some extra energy towards the movement during the concentric phase. A while ago, I did a video on grip training for grapplers. And in the video, I described some of the differences between muscles and tendons. Even though tendons are non-contractile, their primary function is to distribute force from the muscle belly to the bone in order to produce movement. This occurs in the same way during the stretch shorten cycle. Now, the amount of resting tendon stiffness may play a role, but that's for another video. All right, so now we have all the components of the stretch shorten cycle explained. Let's tie all these together and see how really good strikers take advantage of this phenomenon. So for those of you who saw my overhand video, this will be familiar. We looked at this and I really wanted to show this view because again, it's a nice slow-mo. It allows me to kind of bring it through this full range of motion. And you can also see actually a different muscle group than I hadn't mentioned before. I had already mentioned that when Johns is hitting DeSantos here, that he takes advantage of the stretch shorten cycle, maybe not volitionally, but that's just kind of how he naturally moves and behaves as a striker, which these are all behaviors. Uh, and they're just, they're using their bodies and their mechanics to their advantage. But these, the muscles like the anterior delt and the pec are muscles that I have talked about before taking advantage of the stretch shorten cycle. What I haven't talked about is the external oblique. And in order to better visualize it, I've actually pulled it up right here. This is essentially, so this is the, uh, the external oblique. All right, so if we, if we zoom in a little bit, we can actually see that the striations run from the upper outer portion of the body or the lateral portion of the body down to the medial portion of the body. So they have attachments on the ribs and then over along the linea alba. Not super important, but if we come up here and we look at the action, it rotates the trunk to the opposite side. So this is the right external oblique. That right external oblique, if, think about it, if these two insertions come closer together concentrically, it would be rotate or helping the body rotate to the left since it's the right external oblique. So if we go and we look at John's, as he's gearing up for this overhand, his hips, we talked about the hip switch, that hip shoulder dissociation. As he switches that, the reason that the hip and the shoulder dissociation is so powerful is because the external oblique is put on a massive stretch here. So they're allowing their body to kind of eccentrically, eccentrically elongate, particularly the external oblique and really the internal oblique on the opposite side, but we won't go that deep. And then as he swings around, as he's done with that eccentric contraction, obliques getting longer, 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 boom, concentric contraction starts after that quick amortization phase. And then we'll see that's the movement that it does, okay? I've already talked about the pec minor, or excuse me, the pec major and the anterior delt at, at length whenever we talk about some of these guys. So we won't go into that too much. Uh, but you can see the eccentric 
the eccentric elongation and the concentric contraction, but I really wanted to focus on the external oblique because I've mentioned the external obliques before, but we haven't really talked about how the stretch shorten cycle works in the muscles of the trunk as well. So, and then he comes around and obviously you guys know the, the end of that guy. So let's watch it. And keep, keeping in mind the stretch shorten cycle, watch it in full effect. Really cool stuff. I know a lot of you are probably asking yourselves, how do I work this into my training? There are really only two things I want you to keep in mind. If the exercise you design has these two components, then you probably have a good exercise. The first thing is it needs to be very quick. If the exercise isn't quick enough, then you aren't reaping the benefits of the stretch reflex. We even see this in studies when people do a pause jump versus a really quick counter movement jump. You get more height from the jump seemingly as a result of a really quick amortization phase, which leads really nicely into the second component, which is that it needs to be a counter movement. If you're training hooks, for example, make sure you're not throwing punches from a stand still and honestly I don't even know what that would look like as you can see I'm having a very hard time even demonstrating it but make sure you're getting that nice counter movement you can even apply this to the trunk with ball throws doing ball throws from a non-rotated position versus reaching into a pre-rotated position and finishing the movement all right guys I hope this was everything you wanted it to be and more as always tell me what you thought about the video or ask any questions that you want in the comments below thank you guys for watching I'll see you next time